Okay, hi. So the reality is I had it on Thursday, not Tuesday, in case you were thinking it was three days ago. But nine days. Um, so uh, there's a picture, I think, of my family, maybe. There's my family, my husband Andy, my son Liam, who's five and a half, and Noah, who's three and a half, and now the newest addition, Colette. So I should have, I wish I could have known that I was going to have the baby before the conference. I would have cued the uh, Simba type <laughs> Lion King thing, but isn't she a doll? I just like to display her as the glory of God. <laughs> so I'm going to hand her back to Lucretia because I will not be able to talk the whole time with her in my arms. So the fun story, um, even with Colette, and I'll have this here in case I need to sit down, um, is so last October, October of 2017, um, I was driving away from living room sessions and I had this, the name of a girl just like in my heart. It just almost like kind of came, came as an impression. It was Colette Victorine and um, my mom's middle name is Victorine. And, um, and I was like, wow, that's interesting. I've always held on to Ava Jane because fun fact, my first boy, the ultrasound tech told us he was going to be a girl. So her name was going to be Ava Jane. And um, she, he popped out a boy, and his name is Liam. <laughs> and so um, I just held on to that other name for a long time, just kind of hoping, like, maybe I'll have a little daughter one day, and she'll be named Ava. And so I had this name drop in my heart named Colette. And um, fast forward a couple months, and um, I found out what the name meant. And I was like, oh, wow, it means people of victory. And Victorine means victorious in French. And um, that was like, whoa, like a double victory. That's amazing. Well, the, the cool part about that too is that um, I had had already two miscarriages at that point. Um, and the, the amazing thing about that name is that the Lord, I really felt like, was starting to stir something in me about having a little daughter and that, that I could believe for that and still hope for that. And I had a friend who... So that was like October, and then in like early spring, I found out the name, meaning, and it was like, wow, that's even more. And then my friend also had a dream that, um, oh, first part, then I was at UR of 2018. And when I was leaving UR, I just had like an impression again, just kind of like in my mind's eye a little bit of um, me holding a, ba a newborn baby girl at the next UR conference in an infant carrier. Okay, um, and I was like, oh, wow, that's, it was just kind of a flash a little bit, it wasn't like crazy, but um, then my friend later in, in the spring, she had a dream that, um, that I came up to her and said, hey, I'm due in January with a baby girl, and that would be that next January, so like this month, <laughs> and, um, and so just with those little deposits there, um, so I ended up having my third miscarriage after that dream um, in April of this past year. And, and then a month and a half later, I found out I was pregnant. And honestly, y'all, I, I, it wasn't really a shock to me when we found out it was a girl. Although we were doing it on the 10-week mark. We're like, finding out. We're <laughs> finding out this is a girl. And, um, and so we found out that this is a baby girl that I was carrying. And so it was such a sweet thing of the Lord to like have those, those deposits of faith and hope in my heart, even with a third miscarriage, that there was like a no, like we want to believe God for life to come, you know? And so anyway, that's just like, just my first testimony to you um, today as I, as I speak with you about hope and just to believe in God for the things that he puts in our hearts. Um, and things may not always turn out the way we think, um, but we still, honestly, y'all, until our dying day, we still will hope. That's the kind of people that God calls us to be, isn't it? That we would be people who are stubborn to hope. Like, even if you're not a stubborn person, that he would deposit in you an ability 
to stubbornly hope. I'm a stubborn person, so it kind of works on my behalf. Um, but it's like to be doggedly, like just intent, resolved on hope. And I feel like that's what the Lord put in my heart today to share with you and to give you some snapshots in my life of what he's done. I feel like he's already set the stage with Brittany and just everyone. It feels like there's these threads in there of like different things. And, um, and so um, I just want to start with just a story about my, um, when I was 23 years old. So when I was 20 years old, I gave my life to Jesus and he radically changed my heart. I mean, my life was like, oh, destruction, partying, drugs, all that stuff, and just completely turned around. And I was so in love with him and just wanted change and a new life. And he really did it. And I was so thankful. And in that time, I was very zealous um, to, to pray for my dad. Um, and he, you know, was an amazing man. He, like, just loved people so well, all this stuff. But I just had such a burden for so long um, to pray for him. And I prayed for him every day for three years. And he, um, when I was 23 years old, he died of a massive heart attack. And um, he had struggled with drug addiction a lot of his life. Um, and so that was very, very painful, just walking through that and, and kind of like that, that grief of like, oh, I was like believing God for a miracle, like for him to turn around and be this Christian man who like would love God the rest of his life. And he was such an evangelist, like in nature, that he would be like going to the nations. I mean, I just had all these hopes like for my dad and they were cut short. And um, so I remember even just the, the, all the things that started happening in my heart of grief. And I, but up to that point, I'd been pretty kind of Pollyanna about things like, life's going to be good. It's like, you know, and we have God. And, and it just, there was kind of like a little bit of like a, not a naivety, but a little bit for me, like a denial of things being bad in life. Um, but once I hit this place of grief, losing my dad, it feel like, I feel like it changed my life forever in my walk with God. Um, and I, I honestly feel like it was, it was for the good because what it did is that it caused me to like run into the most, like the deepest places that I could with the Lord that I knew how at 23 um, to run into his presence, to learn how to grieve well. I had people around me, really great mentors around me helping me grieve well, to move into it, to go into the grief. And so, you know, I remember in that time um, discovering the book of Lamentations. I was like, wow, it's actually in the Bible, an entire book called Lamentations, which means sadness, sorrow, grief. It's in the Bible. I'm like, okay. And so I read it, and, you know, Jeremiah is described as like the weeping prophet, he kind of had a bad job. I was like, sorry, Jeremiah, you're just going to have to go cry everywhere. And so, um, so he did. He said, my, let my tears be like fountains. I mean, his, it's like his voice as a prophet was just his tears a lot of the judgment that it was coming on Israel, the, the rebellion, the sin, the, the repercussions of their, their stuff, like the things that they were doing. He had to be the prophet, weeping for all that. Call out the wailing women. I mean, he just was like calling out grief and tears and all these things. And so I sat in Lamentations. And I just read it and read it. And I, and I found 30, uh, 3, 21 through 24 that just says, And this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. And I remember just zeroing in on it. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was like, This, Sarah, just read this and meditate here. That the Lord's loving kindness, it's new every day that we can trust him, that, you know, I'm paraphrasing right now, but just what came out of that, that his mercies are new every day, that we can have hope. And I remember having a little tiny Bible that I took on mission trips. It really was like that big. Um, and I re remember reading Romans 5, 1 through 3, and it was like at the end of the page, it, it ended with, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And after my dad passed away, I was like, you know, it was kind of funny. I'm like, what does it say on the next page? <laughs> I don't know why I didn't read the rest of the chapter. But anyways, um, but it said, and, and not only this, but we rejoice in hope 
of the glory of God. I mean, we I'm sorry, rejoice in hope of the glory of God, but not only this, we rejoice in our tribulations, knowing that they produce perseverance, character, and character produces hope. And, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. So that was the next like anchor. It was like, oh my goodness, I just meditated there. I cried, I sought the Lord. There were times, y'all, I was a waitress and I had to smile every day and like talk to people. And I would go into the, the freezer area and I would just bawl my eyes out. And I would just come back and I'd be like, okay, I gotta do life. But I would just like go and cry and just go do life. And, um, and so, you know, Romans 15, 13 became a life verse of mine. It says, may the God of hope Fill you with peace and joy as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that really has been another anchor for me um, in life. I love the Psalms of lament, but also the Psalms, it just, you, you see so often it has all this, where were you, God? Why did you do this? Why? And it says, yet I will hope in the Lord. Yet I will trust in him. Yet I will do this. And that happens over and over and over again with the people of God throughout scripture, throughout history. Just this coming back to this place, like, I will not be in hopelessness. I will live in a place of hope. <clears throat> you know, fast forward a little bit in that time. Um, another place where the Lord really stirred hope in me was in my single years. Um, I had no dates, not even one, for 12 years. Clap for me. Just kidding. Uh, and uh, I cried almost every day about it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I do have a lot of journals of crushes, though. <laughs> I feel like the Lord was like, again? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll talk about this guy again. <laughs> but um, I almost want to, like, tie them with a bow and then, like, burn them or whatever. Anyways. But, um, so, but I was waiting and hoping and praying. And I even remember with Steph, like, we were in a season. She was waiting and hoping and praying for Jada. And I was waiting and hoping and praying for a husband. And we just, it was just these turmoil in my heart of just like trusting and, and asking and and you know when every birthday came and then I hit my 30th birthday I'm like all right okay um and then it was like all right Jesus not sure what you're gonna do um and all my peers were marrying girls that I was discipling <laughs> it's like here you go here's another wife um <laughs> raise her up get her married um so totally a joy totally a joy but also had to have cry sessions about it. So, um, so anyway, I know that I can sing a happy song on this side as I show you a fun picture and I have my little third baby up here. And, but you know, in those moments, I didn't have that assurance. So I just want you to know, really it's just, I just want to encourage you to hope. For whatever reason you find yourself unmarried, that there still is a place of hope. We don't have a promise always. But we can still, we can still trust the Lord there. And I got married at 34 and then soon after we had a baby and, um, yeah. So when I hit, when I hit 31, my body started breaking down health wise and I was deeply disappointed at my weakness. I just had so much like, oh, disappointment and grief. And, and I had so much heart disappointment at that point being in ministry and just having, um, a lot of moments with people that just their choices or for whatever reason they weren't being delivered out of addictions or things that were happening in their lives and I just started getting so weighed down. You know the verse says like run the race with endurance, take off every weight that hinders you. Well that was becoming like such a weight. I mean I just so disappointed, so sad for what God, what God wasn't doing in people's lives. I started to put up walls with him and get really angry with him and why are you doing this to people and what's happening and I wasn't releasing those things I was kind of holding them in and I was like just trying to muscle down and and so I remember being afraid I took a sabbatical I was so afraid to to finally face my disappointments because the lie for me was that it was never going to end and um it was going to be an endless pit and I was so afraid of like what if I fall apart for like years like what would happen you know and so I just said that fear and everything just kind of kind of kept me bound up, but I found that it was untrue as I finally had the courage to journey in that place through friends and mentors and just the Holy Spirit helping me. 
And as I dove into those deeper griefs and disappointments, he was allowing me to release more and more hope. It was releasing more and more hope in my heart, all of that. My childhood disappointments, deeper griefs, things still undone in the kingdom that I've prayed for and sought God for. Places I've been in the world where I'm like, why is there so much poverty? We saw in compassion. Like, I get caught in the why sometimes. Like, what is happening? But you know, the, this world belongs to the enemy. It, I mean, the, God is restoring in the kingdom. Waves of revival are coming to restore and to, to bring new life. But the reality is, the prince of the air is over this world. He is, he is, the prin- he is working in the sons of disobedience. And I hate that. It's like, I just want to go on a rampage. And, um, and the Lord's like, channel it in prayer, Sarah. Channel it in prayer. Um, and so, but what can happen is if I don't, and I'm not releasing it, it starts gripping my heart with bitterness, hopelessness, powerlessness, helplessness, every kind of ness, everything that becomes darkness and death, it starts gripping us. If we don't go there and release those things. I told you the story of my miscarriages. My first one was on my 40th birthday. Um, and that was, a, that was huge. But the Lord helped me. He helped me lean into it. And not just go, you know what? Forget it, God. If you're going to do that, forget it. That's, that's our flesh response. And that is not going to bring life. It's just not. And... So he helped me lean, lean in more. Um, you know, it's interesting, um, Damaris, just a little quick nugget, she said in the, the break room over there, she, she said, you know, my other mantra is just die. You know, die to ourself. Live in the book. I don't think that's what it was. Live in the, live in the Bible and, and die. And I was meditating on that a little bit. And I was thinking, it's a good mantra, right? <laughs> um, that's why she's so fragrant though I mean it's like life coming out of her Um, but when we hold on to our disappointments and grief we are holding on to the deaths if you think about that that we've experienced we can't die because we are holding on to death and so we cling to them we can't let them go there are reasons why we cling to them but it becomes a hindrance as we're trying to die to ourselves and say, whatever you want, God. These disappointments, these griefs, these laments, these things that have happened, they, they just, they, they chain us in and we can't, we start saying things like, but God, you owe me this. But no, God, you took that from me, so I'm not going to die for you. I mean, we start to get a little battle, you know what I mean? Like entitled and like, no, what about you, God? You know, I mean, that's just... That's in our spirit if we don't, if we're not careful. And even what about, you should have done this in my life. Wait, Lord, I don't think I can trust you if I die to myself because you allowed these things to happen to me. What if you make them happen all over again? What if I really trust you? What if I really trust you, God, and I lose another baby? What if I really release this grief to you and then I I still live in that place? Well, like Brittany was talking about, we don't have to be afraid of our worst case scenario. And I love what she said about, it's just time to let those things go. It's time to let the bitterness, all those things that, to move into places of joy and hope. So I just want you to know what I'm not saying is that when grief shows up or we are feeling disappointed that we should ignore it. Just be like, no, 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 I'm supposed to like, I'm supposed to just live in this place with God and but we should lean into it and feel it and it is a reality we need to emote we need to weep we need to lament or do whatever we need to to move through it not around it this will not free us y'all okay we have to move through it like the waves when Jamie said when the waves are coming just put your arms out just kind of like fall out that's in a sense y'all what we have to do with with these with grief and disappointment we don't have to be afraid. And something that I feel like the Lord was really stirring in me, even here, um, I kind of like came up and I was like, okay, I'm talking now and I have a baby and oh, she's been passed off. And I'm like getting into my like groove here in my heart. 
And so I just want you to, I want you to know that as I've been meditating on this, something the Lord has been like even stirring in me too um, is some of the things that have been, been done to you have brought a lot of shame and kept you in a place of darkness. Even what Damara said last night, there's a place of what am I so bad about that I can't be forgiven? Well, there are things that have been done to you, sins that have, been, that have affected you that you might feel like, I, I can't move forward. Like, I, maybe you didn't do it, so you can't, it's not a forgiveness thing, but how, I can't, I'm not worthy of even being loved in this place or being known. And y'all, those are secrets. Those are things that some of us have kept for years, decades and decades and decades. And I feel like what the Lord is wanting from this conference through the next week or month or whatever in your life is that you would find those, you would, you would connect to those places, whether it be through professional counselors, through friends, prayer ministers, whatever it may be, speak out the darkness and what has been done to you and what has caused deep pain and grief, and then to release it. Um, and I, I, just, I just feel like the Lord's heart towards you is one of deep compassion and um, even deep sorrow, like for some of you, there are atrocious things that you would never want to tell anyone. And it, honestly, as I kind of sat and thought about that, I just wanted to be a voice to say, these things should never have happened. It's not in God's design that a man would die of a drug addiction. And his daughter would not have a dad the rest of her life. And she would feel it every time she, when she got married and every time her child, she has a new child, or knowing they'll never know their grandfather. He never would have known my life. And these things are just, but they are the reality in this life. And I don't know why God didn't come and punch somebody in the face before they hurt you. I don't. And I've talked to God about that. I don't know why there are Christians in Pakistan that have no electricity or water. And they sit there and they say, well, we suffer here, but we're, we're going to be rejoicing in heaven. And they just suffer. There's slums. There's, there's girls in dungeons. There's things that have happened to you that I can't even imagine. And the Lord really cares. God is not ashamed to wail. Did you know that? It said Jesus had deep cries and agony on the earth. Jesus was not hindered. He sought the Lord and he cried. And he lamented. And he had agony because he felt, he felt what happened to people. And then he died for it. He died knowing that evil had hurt people a lot and that those people would even be forgiven. How much agony would that even be? And so I think what in my heart what I first want to just say, and it could, be uns it could go unsaid, but I'm just so sorry. I'm just, I'm so sorry that any of you have gone through things that have caused such pain in your life that it has crippled you, that's kept you in darkness and secrecy and probably given you physical ailments. And, and there's mental health issues that come from those things too, and there's just so much. And so I think just really, really what my heart's desire is now is as we're wrapping up and is um, that the Lord wants to call you up. He wants to call you um, to a place of healing that today is the day, that this is the time to, to release. And sometimes we may not feel like we're ready. There's no forcing anything. But if there is something in you that you know is right here, and you know you've needed to release that. 
you, you have needed to let it go and be either forgiven or to forgive or be healed in whatever manner. I just feel like in this time, if Lizzie, you could come up, um, that, that this is just, it's, it can even be a couple minutes. I don't even know what the Holy Spirit wants to do, but what I feel like in my heart is that this altar is, this is open and the Lord is beckoning and calling um, for you to come and release your disappointments, your griefs, pain, shame, whatever it is that is holding you back from being able to die daily and do the work of Jesus and rise up with hope and power. What he has for you is to live a life to be able to go to the nations, to be able to go out and be a, a lighthouse to the world. And if any of this, if any grief, disappointment, bitterness, if any of that is hindering you, he wants it to be gone. He really does. And so as Lizzie plays, we're just going to have a couple, a little bit of time here just to have you come. And we're going to have the UR team just come and pray um, over you. It's not even going to be, it doesn't have to be long. Um, and so that's just going to be the next, next few minutes. That's, that's kind of what's in my heart um, for you to do. I'm going to pray, and there's no pressure. There's nothing. If you want to just stay in your seat and cry or whatever you want to do, you don't even have to cry. But I feel like if you want to cry, then I bless you with tears. I do. Because some people want to cry, but they are so bound up that they can't. I'm not forcing anyone to cry, but if you want to cry and you can't, I want you to be released. And so, so I, I release you. I do. I release you to have a gift of tears for yourself, for your family. I release you to have a gift of tears over the things that have hurt you. To release it, to emote it, to say, God, I was raped. Why was I raped? God, I need to connect to this. I need to cry about it. I need to do something with it, and I need to release it. And it doesn't happen all the time right at this moment, but I know many of you have already come in with things that have been in your life for a long time. And so this is the time. This is the time to just rise up, to release it and rise up with power and with hope.